Welcome to the webinar. I'm Chris McCloskey, a member of the Early Careers Committee, and I'm delighted to welcome you to our fifth webinar of the year. Before I welcome our panellists, I'd like to introduce the British Society of Soil Science as host of today's, today's webinar. We're an established international membership organisation and charity committed to the study of soil science in its widest aspects. We've been together those working within academia and have a growing membership among practitioners implementing soil science in industry, as well as those with a keen interest in soils. On behalf of the Early Careers Committee, it's our pleasure to be hosting today's webinar. And now more than ever, a great time to be an Early Careers member of the society. Early Careers membership supports members from the first year of an undergraduate degree through to five years post-qualification with no maximum tenure. The Society offers a number of grants to early career members which can be applied for online and we also host a bi-annual conference. This year we have introduced an e-letter specifically for early career members which is published every two months and will be published in a number of resources to support with career progression. Finally, I just wanted to remind you that in three months time on behalf of the International Union of Soul Sciences we will be hosting the World Congress of Soil Science in Glasgow from 31st of July to 5th of April. For those who may not be aware, the Congress is a leading international soil science conference held every four years in different countries and attended by over 3,000 soil scientists from around the globe. On Monday, 1st of August, during the Congress, we'll be hosting an early careers networking event and we'll release further details in the coming weeks. We really hope to see as many of you there as possible. Right, before we begin, some basic housekeeping. As there are so many of you here today, all your microphones have been muted. We'll be taking questions at the end of, the, of both presentations and my colleague, Izzy, will monitor these for us. Please could you submit any questions you have by 12.50 p.m. to allow us to get through as many as we can. Although there is a raise your hand button, we won't be using this unless the presenter specifically asks for a show of hands. Today's presentation, has also been awarded BASIS and NROSO CPD points. If you are registered with either body, please contact, direct us, please contact us directly after the event. Finally, please be aware that we are recording today's presentation. I would now like to introduce our first presenter, Dr. Rhea Mitchell. Rhea completed her PhD on mesoproterozoic paleosols in 2010 from Royal Holloway, University of London. Since then, she has undertaken three postdocs, one at the Natural History Museum London and two at Swansea University. Rhea is currently an experimental officer in X-ray computed tomography at the University of Sheffield. Rhea is interested in the methods by which ancient terrestrial life lived on or within their substrates to promote organism-substrate interactions, whether in soil development and biogeochemical cycling. This is through studying rocks for physical, chemical and biological indications of these interactions and weathering but also from studying present-day primordial landscapes as modern analogues, such as cryptogamic ground covers containing bryophytes and lichens from Iceland and New Zealand. She employs numerous techniques to better understand these processes, tomography, microscopy, chemistry, and combinations of the above through correlative microscopy. It's important to understand these processes, particularly at various scales, to recognise how primordial biospheres contributed to shifts in biogeochemical cycling and ultimately world earthwide climate millions of years ago. Specific time periods of interest include the evolution of first terrestrial plants and biologically mediated soils in the early Paleozoic and the initial colonisation of land surfaces by microbial crusts in the Proterozoic. Rhea is also interested in paleobotany and paleosoils or fossil soils. Over to you Rhea. Thanks Chris. Um, hopefully you can see my screen. That's perfect, yes. Yeah, okay, cool. Right, so let me just uh, get rid of that somehow uh, okay so uh, thank you um, everybody for being here today um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about paleosols so these are also known as fossil soils um, in the geological rock record and what that can tell us about environmental climate and evolutionary change through geologic time so 
The talk is broken down into two separate sections. Um, the first is on paleosols, what exactly they are, how they're preserved, what information they can give us, and a few examples from the geologic past which show different features. Um, and then the second part of the talk is going to be on a specific example, and that's looking at soils and the earliest land plants from around about 450 million years ago, and um, then how we can look at modern analogues and how that tells us about what these early primordial land landscapes might have looked like. So first of all, uh, what is a paleosol? So a paleosol essentially is a fossil soil, and that is the remains of an ancient soil. Um, there are basically two types of paleosol, those that are more recently formed that, that are still soil-like, so that corresponds with, quest with uh, the image one in this um, on this slide. Um, these are buried by later deposits, but they're no longer actively forming in the same way, so they still wouldn't count as a soil or classify as a soil in um, uh, yeah, just forming in the same way as they do as modern soils. And then the second time is one that has been um, buried and has been lithified. So it's gone through the rock forming process and it's been preserved in the sedimentological record. So it essentially turns to a rock. So this is the type that I'm mainly going to be focusing on today, those fossil soils that have been preserved in the rock record. So you can see from both of these processes that it's kind of a factor of time as to um, how well these soils can form in the first place and then how well they can be preserved. So I'll come on to it in the next slide in a second, but one of the main ways in which these paleosols can be preserved is if there's a big event, a very quick event, which happens right after the soil's formation, um, such as a lava flow, as you can see on the top of this paleosol in the number two image. Um, which basically preserves the soil in situ so we can study it um, millions of years later. So um, the paleosols form part of the sedimentary um, rock bracket, if you like. They're the same sort of deposit as you'd get for fluvial or river or lacustrine or lake deposits. Um, they are composed of a variety of different grades of sedimentary rock from sandstones to silt zones. Um, and then we can study them to look at their physical characteristics and also their chemical characteristics to then determine various things about how they form. So it's basically an insight into how these soils formed um, in the geologic past. So first of all, I just want to go through how a soil becomes a paleosol. Um, as you can see in these two images, you'll first of all have your soil development, which will form under sort of normal circumstances, if you like. Um, that soil then needs to avoid things like soil erosion. So if there are big floods, it needs to not be washed away. It needs to be preserved in situ. So that comes back to the idea I just mentioned about a big event, like a lava flow happening straight after the soil formation. Um, or it needs to be be um, developing in an area that's not quite a high energy environment. So for instance, um, this GIF at the bottom just shows a meandering river system over numerous years and how that river system changes its course over that time. Um, so this paleosol basically needs to avoid being removed by these processes. Then it needs to go through the rock forming um, process. So this includes lithification and diagenesis. Um, it needs to be buried, it needs to be compacted, cemented, fluids expelled and porosity destruction for it to be able to turn into a rock in the first place. But it needs to avoid a process called diagenesis. So this is something that happens when sediments turn into a rock. Um, that rock, that's, those sediments get buried and then they are prone to higher temperatures and pressures depending on how deeply they are buried. But once you get to a certain point of being buried, um, you get something happening called metamorphism where the rock actually changes its structure because of those high temperatures and pressures. So we need to avoid that if at all possible. So it preserves as much of the primary information as possible. And then finally thinking slightly bigger picture and over longer time scales, so it needs to avoid various different um, uh, tectonic um, situation. So it needs to be forming in an area that's away from uh, these subduction zones, or it needs to be in an area that's not going to be on one of these um, plate boundaries. So it's got a lot to go through, basically. So essentially, there are three um, ideal scenarios for paleosol preservation. The first, as I've mentioned already, is that a there's a fast deposition of another event on top, such as a lava flow. The second is that it isn't buried very deeply and it has limited alterations, so it preserves as many of those uh, primary features as possible. And then the third is that 
ideally it will form in a continental interior also called a craton so the example shown here shows the central part of the united states which hasn't really changed very much in 600 million years because it's not near one of these plate boundaries so ideally it will form under one of those situations um, so thinking about Paleothal through the geologic record then, um, this diagram just shows going from 12 o'clock, if you like, that's the formation of the Earth. As we move our way clockwise around this diagram, we move through um, various geological time periods called the Hadean, the Archean, the Proterozoic, and then finally into the Phanerozoic. And you can see um, the time period of each of these. So we go from four billion years, three, two, one, and then from around about 550 million years to the present. So we know that the oldest um, metasedimentary rocks are around about 3.75 billion years old. Um, where do paleosols fit into that? So controversially, the oldest paleosol is about 3.5 billion years old. Um, we have some microbial signatures in some paleosols from uh, this excellent paper by Ryan Holland from 2000, which is, puts these earliest microbially induced paleosols at about 2.76 billion years ago. Um, and then it isn't until we get to about 1.2 billion years that we start to get the oldest terrestrial microfossils. So the terrestrial microfossils we find in the 2.76 billion year old paleosols are generally have some sort of marine involvement, but the ones at 1.2 are 100% terrestrial. So it's not until then that we start to get um, an, a, 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 a terrestrial organism involvement. And then when we get to about a billion years, we start to get pedogenic SMEC type forming. So um, unlike terrestrial body fossils, as you can see, we get paleosols found throughout the geologic past. Um, these paleo environments that they form in vary a lot over geologic time. So if we can find a paleosol, it can tell us a little bit more about the environment at that particular time. Um, and then the evolution of different soils and terrestrial life, in particular plants, occurred hand in hand. So that's something I'll come on to in a little bit later in the talk. <clears throat> so if we were to find a paleosol in the field, what would it look like? And essentially, we see the same sort of features that we find in modern soil. So the majority of the paleosol classifications are based on the USDA soil survey um, classification of modern soils. And I think that's mainly just because traditionally paleosol workers have been American. So they've just chosen to use this particular um, categorizing of them. So some of the features we can see um, include soil horizons. So we can see A, B and E. Um, we can see different colours, we can see mottles, oxidation reduction, which again can tell us about the environment in which it's forming. We can see various different soil textures, we see different um, mineralogy, so for instance clay formation as I mentioned on the previous slide. We can see peds, cutans, um, biological components, so roots, terrestrial organisms, traces, burrows, drab haloed root traces, pedo mineralization, and we can see microfabrics. So all of these um, can tell us exactly about how it formed, the five factors of soil formation, and information about its paleoclimate, paleoenvironment, and paleoecology. So I just want to run through um, four examples in these slides. And this just goes through four different periods in geologic time. And this red circle in the middle um, indicates where the UK was at that time. So the chart, the bar on the right, on the left hand side, sorry, um, goes from the Ordovician, which is about 450 million years ago, right the way through to the modern day. Um, during the Ordovician, around about 450 to 500 million years ago, we were at high latitudes, but in the Southern Hemisphere. And this was when we had this, um, this movement from greenhouse to temperate um, to gl glaciations um, through that time period. So there was quite a lot going on. Um, as we move into the Carboniferous, so we're at um, equatorial latitudes, high temperatures, lowland swamps, and it was very swampy, a little bit like the Florida Everglades, Florida Everglades is today. When we go through to the Jurassic, we've continued our movement northwards. And then as we go into the Quaternary, so this is pretty much modern day for a, for a geologist, we're in these high latitudes where we have this sort of temperate uh, climate. So you can see as geologic time for the United Kingdom anyway has gone on, we've had that shift in paleo environment. So now I'm just going to run through a few different examples through those different time periods as well. So here is an example um, from 1.1 billion years ago, looking at mesoproterozoic paleosol. So this is actually what I did my PhD in. Um, we found a variety of fluvial and lacustrine deposits, these sandstones to siltstone grade material, which contained a variety of these um, very, very, very basic 
soil horizons. We can see things like sea horizons, work, so we can see where the paleosol is formed on various different lava flows. And it contains a variety of other information, inclu including microbialites and mists, which are microbially induced sedimentary structures. So these can be physical um, indications of these, um, these past microbe communities in the soil. So it seems likely that these soils were probably in some part formed by these microbial processes, so biological weathering. And we can do things um, like take a um, geochemical profile through some of the paleosols, like you would with a modern soil, and track the differences in the chemistry through the soil. So we can look at that in comparison to the parent material and see how much material has been weathered and has been lost from that material. Um, here's an example from about 400 million years ago. So this is from a time period called the Devonian, and this is chock full of caliche paleosols. So we have these bands of calcium carbonates within them. Um, this is forming in an arid environment. So this is all of these paleosols are bright red. They're very oxidized and they contain a load of different material, including burrows, uh, plant material and plant root traces as well. So these would maybe um, be called something like an aridosol. Um, when we get to about 350 million years ago, this is when we get these carboniferous swamps. Um, and these are chock full of lycopsid trees. And you can see in the image here, here's one in situ where you can see some of the roots um, going down into the paleosol beneath. So it's not very often that we get a paleosol with um, a tree in situ as this. We get some smaller um, plants and some um, root traces and that kind of thing. But to get something this large is very, very unusual. Um, and these, these sorts of paleosols here would be termed something like a histosol because they are so organic rich. Once we go through to the Jurassic Cretaceous border, so this is about 145 million years ago, um, this is an example of a paleosol called the Great Dirt Bed, which is found on the south coast of England, um, which is forming in between a variety of different marine incursions. So you can see the reconstruction in the top right here. You have this swampy sort of coastal lagoon type environment with all these flying reptiles flying overhead. And you have, um, yeah, these organic rich paleosols which form in between these um, marine incursions. So again, this would be something like a histosol. And we also get these plant or these tree trunk root traces where these thrombolites, these microbial discs are formed at the base of tree trunks. And um, the tree trunk has subsequently eroded away um, and degraded, but it has left this thrombolite, which is formed into a rock beneath it. So you can find these in the fossil forest in um, on the south coast of England around the Lulworth Cove sort of area. Um, and then finally going uh, a bit nearer in time again, so this is around about 35 million years ago, the Eocene Oligocene boundary, where we have these fluvial plains um, and we have these paleosols forming within these fluvial plains. So each one of the red bands here is a paleosol. And then you get an event where you get flooding onto the floodplain. You get all of these sandstones developing, which are these fluvial sandstones. And then the river might recede again, and then you get more paleosols. So you've got this complete succession of paleosols forming upon paleosols upon paleosols and other fluvial environments. Um, one final example then from the Eocene Oligocene includes some work I did as part of my fourth year undergraduate project. And this is looking at pay a variety of paleosols across the Eocene Oligocene boundary on the Isle of Wight. So the Eocene Oligocene boundary is a time going from a hothouse environment through to an ice house environment in the Oligocene. So you've got this rather dramatic shift where you go to glaciations into the Oligocene. So we were looking at paleosols as a proxy to try and look at mean annual temperature and mean annual precipitation of these paleosols to try and see if that links up with some of the other proxies. And one of the important things with these paleosols is that we have a lot of biology included within it as well. So you can see this gastropod Linnea shell. So it gives us an indication of what sort of organisms were living within these soils as well. And one final example um, is just a paleosol, which is fairly recent. I think it's from the Quaternary. Um, and this is just forming on a basalt. So we can make out the different um, horizons within the soil. Um, yeah. OK. So. That hopefully that just shows you why studying paleosols is important. It can give us information about the five factors of soil formation. It can tell us about the paleo environment, the geochemistry, paleo atmospheres to a point as well, where we can use the geochemical information to tell us about weathering and paleo environments. But possibly the most important thing is the link between these paleosols and the evolution of plants. So this evolution um, contributes towards carbon drawdown. 
drawdown into the paleosols themselves, so organic carbon burial and weathering. Um, it led to a change in the sedimentary system evolution as well, which I'll come on to in a second, and it provided habitats for fauna. So before this time, we didn't have very many ter terrestrial organisms, but once we start getting these land plants and these um, micro jungles, if you like, for these fauna to live in, then that really gives these, place, these organisms um, a place to live. So this is the same chart, again, just flipped on its side. So I'm just going to go through the evolution of various different um, plant types through geologic time. So the earliest, one of the earliest land plants we have is called Cooksonia. So this is from 4.33 million years ago. This is in the Silurian. Um, you get this geologically quite quick evolution to about 383 million years ago, where we start to get the first tree. So this is Archaeopteryx, which is a, um, a pro-gymnosperm, and it has fern-like leaves. Um, then we get to the Carboniferous coal swamp forming organisms such as Lepidodendron. Into the Permian we start to get Ginkgo, which is a non-flowering seed plant, but we still get those at the modern day, as I'm sure you're aware. Into the Jurassic we start to get some um, other tree-like plants, so these are called Araucaria, so these are evergreen coniferous trees. Um, into the Cretaceous we start to get the first angiosperms, the first flowering plants, and then into the Paleogene Paleo, yeah, the Paleogene, um, we start to get the first grasses at about 60 million years. So as I mentioned, hand in hand with that, we seem to get a very crude evolution of different soil types as well. So you can see this chart at the right hand side, taken from Greg Ritalik's textbook. Um, you start to get a shift in different soil types as these plants evolve. So grasses would form mollusol like soils. Um, these Araucaria like trees might form ultrasoil like soils. Ginkgo might form something like a forest soil, like an alpha soil. Uh, Lepidodendron, as I've mentioned already, would form these swamp like um, histosols. Then Archaeopteryx would form quite basic soils in comparison because they didn't have very extensive root systems. So these would be insectosol like. And then in terms of the earliest land plants, we don't really know. And one of the problems is with that is because we don't have um, a very good fossil record because a lot of the deposits from the Ordovician and the Silurian are marine. We don't have that many terrestrial fossils. So it's difficult then to figure out what these look like. And that's where modern analogs can come in helpful. So just going to show you this chart very quickly. This shows an evolution from the Silurian to the end of the Carboniferous of the earliest land plants. Um, coincident with this evolution of different land plants, we have a decrease in atmospheric CO2 as well. So that is thought to be because of this expanding terrestrial biosphere. And one of these plant groups that we're interested in are these, this transition between these cryptogamic ground covers and the earliest very small statured land plants, which didn't have extensive rooting systems um, and basically were quite, were quite basic. Now there's a fossil unit called the Rhiney Chert, um, which is from Scotland, and this is a geothermal type wetland envir environment where these um, these very small statured plants were looking and it's all been solidified because it's in this geothermal environment so we get cellular level detail of the plants themselves however we don't get any soils preserved and um, during this time with this shift in this evolution of different plant types as well we move from a very basic um, sheep braided fluvial system with a limited floodplain development because there's no vegetation there to hold any soils or to create um, to create these extensive floodplains. But as we start to get the first plants, we move into the Ordovician and the Silurian, we start to get a bit of stabilization and we get this shift to braided um, river systems. And then we go to meandering as soon as we get these tree-like plants into the Devonian and Carboniferous. So we get this decrease in atmospheric CO2, we get this shift in fluvial structure, but we also get an increase in mud during this time period preserved. And that's thought to be because these plants are weathering their substrates and just weathering to create all of these muds in the sedimentary environment. So I mentioned that one of the organisms that we can look at are these cryptogamic ground covers. Um, these are these ground covers which are composed of liverworts, hornworts, mosses and lycopods. And one thing with my research which we were quite keen to do was to work out what the soil structure might have looked like, what interactions were going on, what weathering was occurring and the stabilization processes that were occurring. So each of these are kind of go hand in hand. So I'm just going to run through very quickly four or five papers worth of material in one slide just to, to, to condense that for you. We've used a variety of multi-scale and multi-dimensional imaging to um, kind of think about those ideas. One method that I use quite a lot is X-ray micro CT. 
So these are some 2D slices through a liverwort soil at the top, a very thin soil, and then we've got a much more complex moss-like soil at the bottom. So we've got this evolution from very thin soils with the very first land plants through to um, much thicker soils as we go through to slightly more evolved, upright forming plants. The interactions that are occurring as well are different. So we go from um, very thin rhizoids or root-like systems to secretions of mucilage to hold sediment material together. But when we get these upright plants, we start to get entrapment within their upright leafy structure. Um, some of the ways in which they stabilize as well. So this, these are some examples from liverworts from SEM images. And we only get some very, very basic um, rhizoid interactions. Whereas obviously when we get these moss-like covers, they're much more extensive. Um, and that ties in with the weathering. So with these earliest land plants, um, with the liverworts, we start to get clay development. So we know that they're able to weather their substrates. And we also get some 3D imaging methods, um, uh, results from some of these 3D imaging methods, which show internal weathering of some soil grains um, and then with the mosses then we get stems that are actually able to burrow through grains and um, contribute towards their weathering. Um, so this is a sum up of some of the um, 3D imaging where we can look at soil cores and target very specific grains to look at the weathering that's going on within the, uh, the grains themselves and then attribute that to biological influence and then um, combine it with some of the chemical information. So some of these bioprecipitates that we see forming in some of these very, very primitive soils. So it's likely that similar processes were occurring in the geologic past. So just to sum up then, um, Paleo soils are really useful because they can be used as an extra proxy to understand past environments, such as the five factors of soil formation, um, paleo environments, geochemistry, paleo atmospheres, and weathering. And modern analogues can really help with that. Um, and the co-evolution of plants and soils is really important for the drawdown of carbon dioxide and organic carbon burial and weathering, and uh, sedimentary system evolution, and then providing habitats for various different fauna. So, uh, yep, yeah, that's it. Um, I'll take questions at the end. I just want to mention as well that if you want to find out a little bit more about some of this um, paleo soil or ancient soil work, I did a podcast for the PaleoCast podcast people um, last year. So this is the link to go and listen to that if you want to find out more. So thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Ruth, for a really fascinating presentation. Um, we'll be taking questions for both speakers at the end of the session. Our next speaker is Lynn Gardner. Lynn is an Associate Director for Environmental Archaeology with Ward Armstrong LLP. Ward Armstrong LLP is a multidisciplinary company with a focus on environment, engineering and mining operating nationally. Archaeology comprises a significant part of the WA workforce and they predominantly work for companies, sorry, for clients to discharge the archaeological elements within their planning process. Lynn has been in her current role within WA for three years, but overall has spent 20 years in environmental archaeology in a commercial capacity. Whilst managing the environmental archaeology team, her main specialisms are archaeobotany and wood charcoal, with an additional interest in mollusks and fishbone. She has worked on the material from a large variety of archaeological projects, from small um, watching briefs to large infrastructure projects from all areas of the UK. Lynn has also been published in a variety of journals as well as archaeological monographs. Over to you, Lynn. Thanks, Chris. Um, just get the PowerPoint up. There we go. So, hi, everybody. Um, as uh, Chris has uh, eloquently introduced me, I'll skip all that bit and we'll just move right into it. So what lies beneath? Putting the senses back into the past. So I'm going to cover what is environmental archaeology, how this is applied in the field and in post-excavation. And I came up with this saying a while ago, and everybody kind of rolls their eyes, and it's quite a romantic view of it, but I do believe that if we have the right uh, material present, we can put the senses back into the past. So I came across this uh, quote not that long ago and I thought it, it really fitted um, archaeology uh, well and I, I, it's just, it even suits environmental archaeology better because the sediment in the soils are uh, really crucial to the surviving, um, the material that can survive 
in these deposits. So in the first instance, what is archaeology? So it's, that's quite a simple thing. Archaeology is the study of the human past through material remains. Environmental archaeology, uh, the study of how ecology uh, and landscape was altered by or for humans. Um, or a more simplistic thing is essentially we study things that were once alive. So environmental archaeology is an umbrella term um, for all these different subspecialisms that exist. Uh, some, uh, if a geoarchaeologist was to see geoarchaeology there, would probably not consider themselves an environmental archaeologist environmental archaeologist. However, um, if I'm looking at a whole suite of environmental material, I will take geoarchaeological report into consideration. Archaeobotany and zooarchaeology uh, tend to be the most common uh, environmental specialisms that commercial archaeological units uh, will have. Um, but we there, there are some zooarchaeologists, for example, that will just focus on animal bones, uh, who will refuse to touch fishbone, for example. So we can be quite niche, but in commercial environmental archaeology, we have to have an understanding of what all these uh, sub um, disciplines require, uh, so we can be able to extrapolate as much information we can from uh, the, the sites. So these are some examples of the material that I'm looking at. So this is uh, some charred plant remains uh, and chaff, and uh, we have some waterlogged grasses in the bottom. Now, when we find these in archaeological deposits, I can start, if the assemblage is good enough, we can start to look at uh, past um, diets, uh, cross -pus crop husbandry practices. We can start to maybe look at the landscape, especially when we bring pollen analysis into it. Uh, these are some charcoal fragments. We can look at, obviously, species um, that are prevalent in the immediate landscape. We can uh, look at uh, wood and fuel procurement uh, procedures as well, for example. So when Earlier, the title of the, the, the slides was uh, putting senses back into the past. So we can all imagine what a wheat field looks like swaying in the wind. And this is where, uh, when I said earlier about maybe I get a bit romantic looking at this stuff. Um, if we've gotten birch trees, for example, we can kind of, we know what a birch tree looks like. So we can start to imagine and put the sights and um, smells back into, into the past. So this is uh, the, the horse burial uh, on the left-hand side uh, was recently found. Um, actually, that was found about four years ago. The the bones that are dry in, in the right-hand picture are also of a horse skeleton, a uh, more recent um, site that we had. Uh, this one of the th while we study animal bones is to look at uh, past um, animal husbandry and butchery techniques and to see how uh, humans adapted species through the years as well. So that the picture of the cattle, the, the brown cattle are modern species and the little black one in the middle is Dexter cattle, full size, same age as the brown ones. Uh, however, that's thought to be uh, representing the size of the Roman cattle. So we can see how uh, humans have adapted species through ages as well. Uh, fishbone that everybody really loves to hate, I find really fascinating. So we can look at fishing techniques, for example, uh, uh, paleo diets as well. The list is endless. I could keep showing you pictures of stuff that we can find. So uh, wild food procurement from the sea, for example, these uh, terrestrial sh sh snails can show us about past um, climate and a uh, landscape and things, uh, insects, same kind of thing, diatoms, for, I could list in everything. If we had a full suite of environmental material, it, we could just paint such a, a lovely picture of the past. However, uh, what we find in archaeological deposits is dependent on loads of things and, and the sediment is um, really important to that. So as we can see, the most prolific, most likely to be yielding would be uh, basic um, waterlogged sediments. However, what we tend to find is well-drained uh, neutral soils, and we can see that there's hardly anything in there. So but what lies beneath, who knows? And 
this is an example either. So this is a recent site that we excavated on in Cumbria. And you can see it's just a normal grassy field. This uh, The client uh, wanted to build some houses there, so entered the, the planning process. And the pre work had been done here previous years, so geophysics had been done. So, and we can see this grey area, the red uh, outlines, of the, the trenches that had been done previous, but we can see this big anomaly in the middle. And once the topsoil was removed, there we can start to see the archaeology. So what lies beneath, we kind of knew what to expect here. So as the archaeological uh, excavation continued, they sampled lots of stuff, um, and we processed all the samples. And this is this drawing uh, was in the final assessment report because we, at this stage, we have to assess the potential for further work. And a lot of archaeological work stops at this. Um, Level. So we can see the pink in the middle is where the um, the hard bottom uh, for the assessment. This is what they thought it was. The yellow blob at the top is a magnetic um, anomaly. There was loads and loads of slag for this site. Previous work had thought it to be a smelting site. However, um, the, we had another archaeometallurgist look at this, and for the samples. We got quite a lot of charcoal and low to hammer scale. So his current thinking, it's a smithing site. So we wrote the assessment report based on that. And usually, as I say, that it stops at that point. However, the local planning archaeologist went, this is really important. So this it does happen, but it's a lot rarer than people think it is. It's actually gone to publication now because, uh, especially that last point, is the archaeometallurgist just thinks it to be the second Cistercian smithy to have been excavated in England. So we've moved away from the previous thought that it's a smelting site onto a smithing site. The, when we look at putting senses back into the past, the abbey was actually not that far away from the site. Um, and the the charcoal as well is shown, and we now know it's a smithy as well, so we can imagine the noise, the smell of the smoke, the smell of the coal, that once again are making it quite romantic. So this is another site, so what lies beneath? So we've done geophysics for this project as well, and geophysics showed very little anomalies. So they, started, uh, they had a watch and brief element put on this. So this is them uh, stripping away the, the topsoil. Um, so as I said, we were supposed to be there about eight weeks because they didn't expect anything. So a year later, and we had 10 of these things. It's the most, it's a really beautiful site. It's always quite photogenic. We've just recently left there and we've took over a thousand samples for the site. The, it's quite, um, the, there was not a lot of artifacts that came for this, but the archaeology itself is pretty amazing. Um, we're just waiting to go ahead for the post-excavation for this site. This is them taking samples in one of their round houses. We do think that we will get charcoal for this. Um, and I just I just wanted to show you as well that what lies beneath, sometimes we don't know. And equally, uh, we might get archaeology, but we might actually not get any environmental material. This is another uh, local site. So in the top left-hand photograph, you can see the Crack Carlisle Cricket Club. And they wanted to, where the archeology span is, used to be tennis courts, and they wanted to get rid of the tennis courts, so they had to enter the planning process. And uh, during that, a few years ago, they found some uh, pits. So the local archeologist, the local planning archeologist wanted further archeological works done. So um, we, the cricket club uh, suggested that they try for a heritage lottery fund and we uh, partnered up with them to get this and we ran this as a community excavation for two seasons. So we, we kind of knew that there was expected roaming activity up in that area. So we can see in the top left hand photograph that uh, I think that's Laura, she's writing up site notes, but what she can see is the photograph uh, on the right. And what that is, is a Roman hypocaust that fed the Roman baths. Now, this is quite a significant um, archaeological find for Carlisle, and everybody's excited about it. Now, the photograph on the left 
little photograph is them taking samples of the the sort of the furnace and the flue area that fed the hypercost that would have in turn heated the Roman baths. Now from that I, I did get a lot of charcoal that was heather charcoal. So we're looking at um sort of a quick burning fire starting kind of charcoal there. And so we can imagine the smoke and the smells for the baths. So once again making it a bit romantic. These didn't go into assessment reports by the way. And I want to show you this because we never know what to expect. This was uh, in a building in Carlisle. Once again, we do go further afield. Um, and I was called out to this site because of this uh, black splodge here. They suspected that it was turves. Now, we did expect to find the edge of a Roman viaduct here, uh, but we didn't expect anything like this. So every uh, stratigraphic layer there was sampled and we put uh, monolith tins to, um, to the, the whole section on a couple of sides and we sent this away. This is um, essentially what Kev drew there. And so we can see the stratigraphy and we actually have more of the, the viaduct bank than we thought we had. This is currently away at Edinburgh University um, getting looked at. So we're looking forward to the results of that. So other things that we can do is that that picture in the middle is shown. I couldn't find a photograph that shows all the monoliths that was in that section. It will be, it will exist. On the left hand side, we are hand doggering to look for PE deposits. Um, this area that we were in was on the edge of a moss. So we were just seeing how far the peat was. I mean, we we're looking for anthropogenic indicators within the peat. Uh, and so we could inform how to treat the archaeology as we move forward. The picture on the, the right hand side is another site uh, at the edge of Peat Bog. And uh, there was Roman, uh, Roman uh, Bronze Age settlement just quite close by. And then as we started to look at the stuff on the edge of the, uh, the Peat Bog, we started to come across these timbers, which we thought well, that actually had something to do with the settlement. So this was us just getting ready to, to uh, figure out how to lift them. <clears throat> so, excuse me. So what we do with these bulk environmental samples is we process them through 500 uh, retent meshes and foot dishes. And the fine silts are washed through the retent and the floaty things like charred grain, <coughs> excuse me, fish bone and things like that are collected in the float dish. So these are the things drying and these are the things are sorted to remove everything. This is a reconstruction drawing, <coughs> excuse me, thought by English, uh, by Historic England uh, for um, uh, Iron Age, Silchester. And a lot of these reconstruction drawings are done by using um, material from the environmental <coughs> archaeological remains. So it's about putting the senses back into the past. Once we can establish what was there, we can get pictures like this. So unfortunately, <coughs> a lot of the environmental remains <coughs> are absent. Um, but this is working in commercial archaeology. And so we can still get excited and we can still hope for the best. And sometimes it works out. So I'd just like to thank everybody for listening. Oh, fantastic. Oh, thank you, Lynn. That was another brilliant presentation. I'm now pleased <laughs> to welcome Izzy Lloyd, who is also one of our early career committee members and has been monitoring the questions that you've been sending in for our panellists. Just as a reminder, please submit your questions by 12.50 p.m give us a chance to get through as many as possible. Over to you, Izzy. Brilliant. Thank you, Chris. Um, and thank you again to our speakers. I really enjoyed um, both of your talks. We've had um, quite a few questions come in already, which is great. Um, if you've got any more, please do send them in. Um, but I will start with a question for Ria, which has come from Chris in our audience. And he's asked, can we see when plant fungal rhizosphere interactions develop in the record of a paleosol? Um, um, 
I, I'm not aware of any that are um, preserved in situ in a soil, and you can actually see the um, fungal interactions within the soil. There are fungal interactions that happen in plant fossils. So the Rhinichur is a perfect example of that, where you've got this exceptional preservation of not just the plants, but all of the interactions that happen within the plant as well. Um, so that's at about 407, 410 million years ago. But in terms of those interactions in situ in a paleosol, it's quite difficult because it's difficult to preserve that interaction for a start um, and also have, you know, to know what to look for as well. Um, so most of the time when people do research on paleosols, it's quite large scale. It's an entire profile. So you're make, maybe sampling at various points throughout the profile to collect samples to then do geochemical analysis or whatever. Um, but a lot of people don't look at the very small scale structures and features that are going on. Um, so that's where, you know, the microscopy work can come in really handy because then you can look at things at various scales. Um, but off the top of my head, I'm not aware of these interactions that are found in situ in the paleosols. Cool, thank you very much. We've also got another question um, from Michael in our audience. And he's asked that he has read in the European Commission book published in 2019, that the oldest known paleosol is that in Ensues in South Africa, I might pronounce that wrong. Um, but he said that the estimated age of the paleosol is about 3,000 million years ago. Do you agree that this is the oldest or are there any other paleosols that might be older than that that you've come across? Oh gosh, so uh, the one that I showed was about 3.2, I think it was. Um, so yeah, 3.2 billion as opposed to 3 billion is actually in geological talk is actually quite <laughs> quite similar. Um, so in terms of the current literature and what's you know 100 well 100 in 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 as much as you can be 100 percent with these things um, of being the oldest, I'm not 100 percent sure of because the one that I knew of was the one that I mentioned in the talk. Um, but there might have been more research that's come out more recently where it's changed in age um but with any of these things you know there's always a bit of controversy as soon as you start getting billions and billions of years ago because obviously that paleosol will have gone through a lot in terms of potential alteration and things so um whether you can yeah yeah there are always pros and cons for all of these things but um but yeah something around that age seems to be the general consensus of around about three billion brilliant thank you and um, we've got a couple of questions that have come in for Lynn. So the first one is from Stephen and Stephen's asked, what do you mean by when you do a site visit and you're taking samples, how do you kind of go about doing the geophysical assessment? What does that involve? The, there's quite a lengthy process that's involved. So the, uh, we send the geophysics, the geophysics is done before we ever go and break soil. Um, and that's usually a report then that's submitted to the local planning archaeologist, so he can um, so he impart his knowledge and see what he wants done. So, yeah, so at every stage we have to write like a W, um, a written scheme of investigation. So we're using all the information that's been taken using the geophysics. So it's not done for every site as well, uh, and then that will infer. Uh, like how we sample um, and such things like that. Every site is different. Um, and I, I do think I've got, I, I try to pick sites that were different and the, but they're much the same, but every site is different. And it's really difficult to put that across, I think. Uh, we just never know what we're going to get. And it's either really exciting or. Hmm. <laughs> Brilliant, thank you got another question for you, Lynn, um, asking, is the area of the archaeology site identical with paleosols? How about area with, for example, a lot of silicified wood near the surface? Does that count as a paleosol? I'm not sure if you can see the question in the chat or if I messed that up reading it out. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, the, once again, it goes back to the every site is different. So where we, we were, um, that photograph where we were about to lift the, the timbers, um, a lot of that, some require, some sites require for it to be a watching brief, for example. So essentially, it's just one person watching the machine strip the, the topsoil. And uh, a lot of the time, that's when we come across stuff. Um, it, it goes back to the, we just never know what we're going to get. 
uh, people mm -hmm. seem to think, you know, a lot of clients will come up and say, yeah, well, there's our archaeology there, and we'll go, we, we don't know. I mean, if the geophysics, sometimes the geophysics can show anomalies and we find nothing. So, and it's the same for any environmental material. And I think that the environmental material is even more difficult to even guess. And like one of my pet hates is when they're excavating on site and then I get asked how much is it going to cost for the environmental archaeology? And we haven't even looked at the samples yet. So who knows? It's a <laughs> mystery. I think that's why environmental archaeology is really exciting because you're like, yeah, no, yeah, no. That relates to something I was going to ask. I was going to ask both of you, but maybe first of all, Lynn, what kind of inspired you to get into this field? What kind of, what, what gets you excited about it every day? The, there's, uh, there's only about three and a half thousand archaeologists, 4,000 archaeologists uh, in the UK, and there's even less environmental archaeologists. And it's, I, I think for me, I, it's really difficult because it was a long time ago when I became really interested in it and went to university and things. That was a long time ago. Um, but what still keeps me here 20 odd years later is, is the excitement. Uh, a lot of sites are like, all oh, right, there's nothing there. You know, the, that site I showed you for uh, up in Invergowrie, uh, I'm so hoping, so hoping that there is loads of environmental material in there. Um, there might not be. That would be so disappointing. But it's that, that it might be, it might be, it's just excitement, I think. Maybe I'm over excited, but that's, that's what it is. The mystery. That's what, that, <laughs> yeah, that's what keeps me still doing this job after this length of time. And also, I just have to put in as well, the environmental archaeologists, all the, the sub-disciplines and specialisms that are there, uh, it's probably the, the difference between commercial and academic is vast in archaeology, but in archaeological science, it's where we come closer together because we rely on a lot of this stuff can only be done at universities. And uh, so I think we our networks are more linked than a normal field archaeologist. That sounds quite dismissive of field archaeologists, but I just think it's really interesting, especially when we can have loads of specialists working on the same thing. Um, and it's exciting watching the stuff that comes out of universities as well and how we can how, how can we adapt that for commercial archaeology? Because at the end of the day, the client's paying us. So just because we want something funky done on um, ancient grains doesn't mean the client is. So it's exciting, though. Yeah, <laughs> we've had quite a few more questions come through. Um, so thanks, everyone. I don't know if we'll be able to get through them all, but we've got one here for Ria. Um, Lewis is asking, to what extent do paleosaur properties reflect the properties that would have existed at the time? So like pH or any organic compounds, how much how much does it kind of change over time? Yeah, that's a really tricky question. And it's one of the biggest problems with especially looking at the deep time um, <clears throat> paleosaurs, because like I said before, they are subject to much more alteration than, than other soils. Um, I guess it's about making a judgment when you first start studying a particular paleosol about its age, um, whether it's likely to have come under lots of alterations, so things like burial and temperature and pressure changes, whether it has come under any metamorphism, that kind of thing. Um, you can get, so compaction is a big thing as well, because obviously if a paleosol is going to be buried under a load of sediment, then it's going to compress. So are you looking at you know, the paleosol as the thickness as it was when it formed? Probably not. But then there are ways, so various researchers, including my old um, PhD supervisor, has written papers about how to account for that compaction based on various different factors in the properties of the, um, of the paleosol. So you can almost restretch it out in reverse and, and look at it properly. Um, things like organic material is a problem because you can have um, maybe molecules in there that you might think are uh, ind indicative of, of biological components when actually they're not. Um, so it's about it's about well it's it's like any science really it's just backing up the evidence with multiple lines of inquiry and that's why doing things like various microscope techniques and then combining that with various sort of chemical analysis can help because you're looking at it from multiple different angles but yeah with the, with the deep time stuff it's 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 a it's a huge problem and that's why it's t quite difficult to specifically say you know what is the oldest paleosol as well because 
something that might have once been a paleosol doesn't look like a paleosol anymore or vice versa um mm -hmm. yeah oh, amazing thank you um we have had another question from james who's just reminded me that i was then going to ask um Rhea, what kind of got you into this field and and what gets oh, what yeah. gets you going about paleosols <laughs> <laughs> well, it's quite similar to Lynn, really. It's the it's the excitement of kind of not knowing what you're going to find. I mean, I've always been I did geology A level. I was really lucky that my sixth form did it because I think only something like 10 percent of sixth forms these days actually offer geology A level. I really like sedimentology. Um, and then from that, you know, I did a third year course on sedimentology and my what was to become my PhD supervisor had um, a lot of information in there about paleosols. I just found it really interesting. Mm -hmm. um, and I've kind of done it in reverse where I've gone from looking at paleosols in the rock record to looking at modern soils. So that's been really interesting. Um, working with different groups of different people, the same as Lynn as well, because soils, you know, form at the interface between the lithosphere, the biosphere, the hydrosphere and the atmosphere. So you get to work you get to work with chemists, you get to work with physicists, you get to work with a whole host of different things. So from my point of view, I keep learning new things all the time because there's just so much to learn. <laughs> um, and especially the biological aspect as well. You know, it's like the, the question before about the fungal interactions. You know, I knew nothing about that during my degree or during my PhD, but I've learned all of that since. And that side of it is really um, advantageous to this is getting to learn new things all the time. Oh, brilliant. Thank you. Um, we've had a couple more technical questions through. Sophie has asked, um, and this could be a question for both of you. How are glacial deposits classed? Um, are these one of the more active processes in the sites that kind of mean that they don't qualify as a paleosol? Um, I don't know who's best to, best to take that question. <laughs> um, from an archaeological point of view, we essentially study the Holocene, so everything sort of post uh, glaciated uh, glaci stuff. Um, but now and again, uh, maybe I'm too far north because we were just under uh, the ice for so long up here. Um, I think it's probably a, maybe it's in between Ria and myself. <laughs> yeah. Um... I don't know. I've never studied sort of like frozen paleosols before. Um, to be honest, I don't. I don't, I'm not really sure because I've, I'm just trying to wrap my brains and think of examples from the literature, but I can't really think of it. There's things like you know, um, things in Siberia that modern things that people study because obviously you know with everything melting, they're a huge problem because all of this carbon's suddenly being released or methane. Um, but in terms of having a paleosol that was once frozen preserved in the rock record that's a tricky one because i guess it's quite it's active it's an active environment but not in something like a river it's active over a long period of time so i guess if you've got a glacial system then you know the chances of something being preserved in that system mm -hmm. is quite low i guess compared to something like a lake which is just going to sit there not doing anything for hundreds of years so the chances are that you wouldn't get it preserved maybe mm -hmm. okay yeah that sounds really interesting thank you um and then maybe we've just got time for one more question which is quite a quick one and um, for you Ria and um, Michael has asked could you repeat the name of the site and the location with the 3.2 billion year old paleosol I can if I bring up my talk because I can't remember it off the top of my head because I have a terrible memory. Um, there's the Warawuna group, which is the 3.5 billion year old paleosol, and that's from a paper by Buick et al. 1995. Um, I haven't got the actual reference for that, like the DOI or anything here, but I've, you know, if, if I can email it to Michael if I get their details. Um, and then there's the 2.76 Ryan Holland paper as well, which is quite quite a good one brilliant um, thank you yeah. yeah hopefully that's helped um michael but if not do you get in touch yeah um, yeah for sure fab thank you very much i think that we might be coming to the end of our um time now um so i will i will pass back to chris um but thank you again to our speakers that was fab
Thanks, Izzy. Um, on behalf of the British Society of Soil Science and the Early Careers Committee, I'd like to express our thanks to Ria and Lynn for coming along to present today with two excellent talks, and for Izzy for coordinating the Q&A session. I can certainly say that I, for one, have learned a lot about paleo soils and environmental archaeology that I, I definitely didn't know before. So thank you all for attending. You'll find a quick survey, uh, a feedback survey, when you leave the webinar, which, you hope you'll, which we hope you'll take the time to complete. The recording of this video will also be available after the event on our YouTube channel. This will be our last Zoom into Soil webinar ahead of the World Congress of Soil Science and we'll be welcoming them back into our events programme from October onwards. Just, to have, just as a final reminder, the World Congress of Soil Science takes place in Glasgow from 31st July to 5th of August and we really do hope you can join us. I hope to see you at future events and in the meantime, thank you again and goodbye.